uh, I think some of your earliest stories was, was in the Dave Pringle interzone in the yeah. late 80s. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there weren't that many. Um, I mean, they were in America, there was a um, digest, there was analog and antelons and fantasy and science fiction, which is a particular favorite of mine at the time. Um, that old mix of stories. So you didn't know what to expect when you got an issue of fantasy and science fiction. Um, but then, um, so I was living in Los Angeles for a couple of years. I came back from Los Angeles and discovered suddenly that it was this um, new science fiction magazine, you know, and they were looking for new writers. They actually said they wanted new writers, you know. So I thought, aha, maybe I could be one of those. And luckily I was. And uh, not just me, but a whole bunch of other people as well. Um, Kim Newman, uh, Greg Egan, Steve Baxter, uh, Gwyneth Jones was already published as a writer, she published some stuff there as well. Um, who else? I mean, Mary Gentle had a couple of short stories in it in the early days, and so on. Um, so it was a great, great venue, and it was sort of trying to shape things up in a way that uh, you, Michael Moorcock's New Worlds had uh, about 10 years earlier. I was, I was odd because I was stuck between the generations. I was slightly too young to, to get published in New Worlds. And then I was sli slightly older than the rest of my fellow interzone writers of that generation. So, yeah. But you also did book reviews for interzone? Yeah, I did. Uh, just David suggested, asked me to do one, and then I did some more. So I did a column for about, um, I can't remember how long it was now, about four or five years. I burnt out. So you're doing four or five books every two months. Right. Yeah. And I had a you know, job at the time as well, an actual serious job at the time. Well, and I was trying to write as well, so I did it until I said, I can't do it anymore, yeah. But, but reading contemporary science fiction, uh, what, what, did that have a, a, anything to do with what you were writing yourself? Um, I was probably quite harsh as a reviewer, actually, when I look back on it, because I had this kind of agenda that, we, that various of us had as well, that we wanted to do, uh, shape things up a bit, so I was... I was, I was kind of harsh on the traditional stuff that was coming out. There's quite a lot of American stuff coming out then. Not that much British stuff, so I wasn't saying I'm kind to the British stuff, but uh, there's a lot of the American stuff I, I was criticizing just because it was the same old science fiction, you know. It's really based on old science fiction, not on, uh, not on the world or around us. Um, so I was keen for that, and I was very keen on, on stuff that was a sort of interstitial, but it wasn't really classified as science fiction, but it had the feel of science fiction, so I like that. What Bruce Sterling called slipstream. This is kind of a term that's fallen out, I think, really, but um, there was around about then as well. So it's, it wasn't labeled as science fiction, but it had that science fictional feel, it had sort of qualities of science fiction there. Yeah. It had the strangeness and weirdness, which was appealing. Uh, among other things, you are known for you're known for um, for doing new space opera. Yeah. Was that sort of part of the agenda to renew the genre? Uh, was it a conscious it, decision? It was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> what happened was that um, I did invent uh, it. Colin Greenland and Dave Pringle, I think, had an editorial about the kind of stuff they want. They wanted um, one of the things they wanted was this sort of idea that they wanted um, to revive the idea of space opera, but to do it anew which appealed to me, because as I said, I, I was all for um, not doing the same old thing. Uh, so Stephen Baxter and I decided that we would, you, we were the new space opera kids. We, were even doing t we never got around to making t-shirts or, or writing a manifesto, but that's what we decided we were for a year. We went around telling people that's what we were doing, we were a new space opera. But it, went, uh, it was called radical, space, um, radical Hard Science Fiction or Radical Space Opera then. Uh, and the new space opera was a term that Gardner Gardner Desoir did. So it's in this etymology that uh, is old. And he added in some sort of American writers who sort of doing this sort of similar stuff. So. But, but that, by the time he did all that, I was no longer writing it. I was doing other stuff. So it was a momentary, momentary thing. The label of stuff. Yeah, so, so you didn't say, set out to say, for instance, like the old space opera has the, these flaws that we will now correct. Yeah. No, well, the thing was the old space opera was the kind of, you know, the um, kind of stuff that Robert Sheckley parodied um, back in the uh, 1950s, 1960s. And that was like the old 1930s pulp space opera with, uh, you know, princesses of Mars and uh, sword fights in palaces and uh, the, the Galactic Emperor and that kind of thing. I wasn't interested in that kind of thing. I was actually interested in um, 
in trying to uh, trying to explore the what was then the new cosmology uh, that people were finding out, you know, like the black hole at the centre of the of the galaxy and things like that, and um, how it actually worked and what it would look like and uh, the new stellar stuff that's coming out and the uh, new ideas about how the universe had uh, been created and, and how it you know, how it was going to end and the arguments that went back and forth. And I was thinking, well, this is kind of interesting, really stuff that such has no relation whatsoever to uh, ordinary human life. So this is ideal material for science fiction. But how can I incorporate uh, this into um, something that's also a human scale story? So that was kind of the challenge of doing that. And Steve Baxter was doing something similar with the CV stories as well. So we weren't, we weren't consciously both saying, right, well, we'll both do this. We both happen to do it because we're both interested in that kind of stuff. And, and yet you went on to, to do several series of novels and short stories that have been in various places labeled as space opera or at least yeah, but space I've done, fiction. I've done a lot of other stuff as well. So, you know, you're just people just picking out one or two things here and there and trying to make it into a coherent um, ideology, which I frankly don't have. Um, <laughs> No, you're very, very. But, yeah. but I'm thinking about, for instance, this uh, series uh, yeah. with the Quiet War. This is the first novel, and it comprises at, at this time, I think, four novels and eight or nine short stories. Uh, well, not quite, mm, uh, quite well. It depends what you mean by short story. But I did. I mean, I, when I finished writing the last novel, I, I wrote off one a week. I think I did. Was it one a day? Blog, my blog. I just put really short stories, vignettes. Oh, like around I'm, more, I'm more thinking about the novellas. But the, 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 well, what happened was the short stories came first. That's the trying out things. And then I wrote the novels, which got a slightly different history than the short stories. Um, but that came about because I got very interested in the images that the Cassini orbiter was sending back, and then the other probes sent back as well about all the various moons and so on, which we talked a little bit about, about the new solar system. Uh, yesterday, so I was very interested in that. Suddenly, here were some very high resolution photographs of, of the moons, and there were maps of the moons, and there were places with names on them. And there's a Shakespearean thing about having a name, and you've named a place, it becomes a place that you can think about people living in, you know. Um, so I started thinking about that, and that's that's sort of how that came about. And there's a bit of the Iraq War Adventures coming in there as well, sort of neo colonialism, and that sort of stuff. So there's a fundamental conflict between the outer outer system yeah. uh, dwellers and the inner system dwellers, yeah. which is also a thing that, that has resonances back to the discussion: how much should you modify your body in order to mm -hmm. in space? Yeah, uh, much like Bruce Sterling has done some mm -hmm. some stuff about. Yeah, it's kind of an ideological situation, and you've got one. On the one hand, you've got very practical people say we need to do this so we can live where we're living. On the other hand, you've got people who say that we shouldn't uh, mess around with nature because look what happened when we messed around with the earth and we messed, we, you know, we had the violent climate change and we just recovered from that and we don't want to start messing around with the human beings. Lord knows what will happen. So. Well, that's at least their excuse for me. Um, I, I think it's, it's, yeah. it's uh, very, very characteristic of this series uh, as a whole. I should say that two of the longer short stories from it is uh, translated into uh, been translated into this uh, collection is that it's complex uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to the older space stories where yeah. you used to have one sort of problem uh, yeah. not you as a person but the people who wrote the older mm -hmm. kind and, and this is more complex you have space exploration you have you have uh, biological modification you have political intrigue you have um, Artificial intelligences yeah. and, and stuff. So, so it's more than more than one thing at a time. I think that's very characteristic. Well, yeah, it's, it's, I got interested in that in that kind of thing very early on in depicting the future. Not as one thing had changed, but as depicting it in the way the present is, which is very complex and very variable as well. So that you don't have, you know, uh, this technology isn't evenly distributed, as Bill Gibson would say. It's so uh, it's not evenly distributed now, so it's not evenly distributed in the future either. So you've got um, that kind of, once you start thinking like that, and it, it does become a bit more complicated. But the reason, the, the, the point about writing the Quiet War and, and Gardens of the Sun, which uh, follows up now, is I wanted to follow five characters through this arc, a build-up towards the war, which is the Quiet War, because the war doesn't come in until the very end. 
and it's open very quickly because it's all in space is you know, all about kinetics. And, uh, kinetics is very fast, very sudden, very violent. So it's about the you know, this build up and how this you know, it's, it becomes sort of an inevitable thing that even though the people who started it they can't control it, it has to happen. So it's a kind of fate thing that they can see coming down the line, and all they can do is prepare for it. Really, they can't stop it. And uh, then, so that's the first novel, and then the second novel is is, is, is the recovery from it. And it's once uh, once the people have conquered a land, what do they do to it? What does that do to them? 